All right, it's our last time together, closing out the weekend. I hope you've had a great time and a great experience. And my prayer really is that you would uh, use this as a catalyst for your own spiritual growth, that you would be excited about the promises that are yes to you in Christ Jesus in the scriptures, and that you would embrace them for yourself, that your church would be strengthened, that you guys would begin to do ministry for people that touches lives and that there would be an opportunity for you to share the story of what Christ is beginning now and continues to do with other people in your groups so that you are all continually reminded that God is at work and he wants to be at work through you and if you let him if you submit to that and buy into that then what he can do through you is Really, and we overuse this word, but it's awesome in that it's beyond us, and yet we get to be part of it. You know what I mean? It's our opportunity to do something with eternal significance, and that is something that we should be pumped about. If you would, turn in your Bibles to Philippians chapter 4. We're going to close just with a short little section here in the book of Philippians because I wanted to give you kind of the beginning and the end so that if you were interested in going back through the book of Philippians, you'd at least kind of know the book ends and you could kind of read through the middle yourself. And I want to just keep it simple because as you go back, I want to give you more to think about, more to to remind you of who God is and what he's done, that that would be what provides you with joy and it helps you as a church group and as a believer find unity with the people of God so that you are continually able to venture out and do evangelism, to share the gospel, to talk about the things that God's doing in your life. And if you feel like that's awkward or contrived or the transitions when you do that are difficult, here's the reality. Anytime you try to talk about a subject that you know nothing about, it's awkward at first. But as you get used to seeing God at work in your life, it becomes more natural. So if it's unnatural, if you feel like you have difficulty, like getting into that flow of thought, what that means is that's an area where God's going to help you grow in. And how exciting will it be to watch as you grow in that way and God begins to use you and and you are formed through the scriptures and, and you're able to bring those into a conversation so that you begin to see that what the scriptures do is they hold up for you a view or a vision of life that you can lay out over your own and see that there is a lot more to the world that you might be observing at first that helps you account for heaven and earth. And when you allow the scriptures to speak to life, you see a fuller vision of the world and your place in it and what God is doing to take it from here to there where it ultimately will be, a place where there is no sin. And to to see that will just continue to give you strength. The scriptures are for us all that we need for godliness. That they have in them the answers of life. And so let's look at the end of Philippians here as we look and think about what it looks like to shine. Just real quickly, let me read this to you again. Chapter 2, verses 14 and 15. This is Paul's encouragement to you. Do all things without grumbling or questioning complaining that you may be blameless and innocent children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted or perverse generation among whom you shine like lights in the world. How do we do that? By holding fast to the word of life, verse 16. So here's a simple command that you can do as you go. Here's a simple command that Paul's going to give that you can work into your life easily and quickly, and this is how I want us to conclude our time together. Verses 4 through 7. It's all we're going to look at. Chapter 4, Philippians, verses 4 through 7. Here's what Paul says. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say it. Rejoice. Let your reasonableness, or you could think of this as a translation would fit, big-heartedness or gentleness, be known to everyone. For the Lord is at hand. Therefore, do not be anxious about anything. But in everything, all of life, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let all your requests be made known to God. And let the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, 
Guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. So here's the command. It is the command to rejoice. So part of what it looks like to shine is that your life takes on the qualities of not you. They take on the qualities and characteristics and they begin to look like Christ so that people are aware that what's happening in your life is magnificent, right? That you go from what you used to be to where you are now and then think about where you'll be 10 years from now. And as people look back on your life, they're like, what's, how are you able to deal with that or to grow in spite of those relationships? Or how did you come out the other side of that? And you can point them to Christ. You know what this means? That everything we're talking about, your growth in godliness, your holiness, the, the reason that God wants us to be holy is so that we can be a missionally effective people. Because the work that God does in us internally is supposed to work its way out of us so that the work that God does with us is personal and intimate but never private. So his work in your heart and mind works itself out and allows you to then share the work of Christ with other people who then can experience the same peace and rest and forgiveness. Part of this means we've got to learn to rejoice, though. We've got to learn what it looks like to be content, to be happy. You know what I mean? Like, I best express happiness typically, I don't know why, but like with a, with a, a, a noise. You know what I mean? Like, when I'm really excited, I don't think of words like to be descriptive. You know, like it would be odd if you like you gave a great Christmas present and the person explained how how good a fit this was in terms of their toy collection and or where in, in the Nerf gun like lineup that they were really lacking and how this it, it fit a real need in your arsenal. You know what I mean? Like that'd be kind of unusual. So I'd like to do something just to kind of get us up. It's been a long day. Because you're going to need to just stand up, if you would. You know, do me a favor. Stand up. Humor me. Microphone is a powerful thing. See how you just did what I said? That's just like the power trip I'm, I'm on right now. So when you are excited about something or you are joyful or you find out good news, like you got into Harvard and didn't apply and you got full funding, you know what I mean? Like, or you got the job that you aren't qualified for and they're paying you like double what you would have asked if you had even had the interview. I mean, like, we're talking about, like, this is ridiculous. You didn't gamble, but you still won the Powerball, and, and people are, like, rewarding you for your faithfulness to your convictions. Like, this level of excitement, we make noises, right? Okay, so, like, I mean, like, your team wins. Like, okay, let's get on the same page. One, two, three. I'm going to count to three, and after I say three, you make your, like, excited guttural noise, right? All right, you ready? One, two, three. See, here, okay, here's the thing. Listen, I know, it, I know it's been a long day, but there are some people I observe that don't think I can tell, like, if, just because you open your mouth that you're, you think you can fool me into thinking you yelled, like, but none of your, like, diaphragm moves, your lungs didn't move, like, your whole body relaxed, and yet you're, like, you know, let's do this together. Just humor me one time, and, and we'll move on. I won't make you keep doing this. But, like, if you can't be excited and use hand motions, like, you ever seen kids that can be excited about something simple? Yeah, it's like movement city. So let's be a little excited about what's happening. Three, two, one. Awesome. All right, you can have a seat. Good. I'm glad you woke up. Good. Some of you, like your happy faces are angry faces, so you need to just maybe go home and see what you, you, you do, and so you can understand why people get kind of nervous around you at sporting events. Here's the thing, okay? Why should we be excited? Why would Paul tell the people of God to rejoice? Here's just the simple reality of the day, that we can be happy because the work that God does in us is special. In fact, the Bible makes it clear that every time there is a story of faith, it is completely original. That God's creativity is endless. And therefore, his ability to inspire us, to excite us, to minister to us, also has an endless capacity. 
So I hope that as you looked around or as you sat through this weekend, that you all of a sudden became aware that God is bigger than you had come to believe that he was. And that his work in you can be infinitely more impactful than you may ever realize. And that's not just a way to like, tack something onto the end of a sentence. I mean that. That just like Paul didn't know what was going on in the life of the girl who kind of tormented him by yelling a constant infomercial, and how that impacted the life of the church, you may never know the true impact of your kind words or the danger and the harm of your thoughtless comment. You're people who get to give life because God gives life endlessly. So what does it look like then to buy into this? Well, here's the thing. Like, you don't have to, like, always be perfect. That's not what we're talking about. That's not what the command to rejoice means. It's not like you have to walk around with this outward expression of emotion. What Paul's commanding is action, not an emotion. What Paul's commanding when he says rejoice, like, do it. It's not a suggestion. It's a command here. It's an imperative. He is telling you to rejoice. He's telling you to take an action. He's telling you that your experience of life needs to be filtering everything through the prism of God is at work, and he's at work in the world and in me, and if I make myself available to him, then he will bring good to my life. And if you filter life through that means, then you're going to be able to rejoice. You're going to bring your mind and heart into a place where you are able to direct praise to Jesus regardless of what happens. Because the danger is, the reality is, if you find joy based on circumstances, right, the right relationship, the right like, status, the right influence, the right position, the right physical profile, if you find joy in that, what happens when it's gone? What happens when things don't work out in, in a perfect way for you? What happens if you lose what you had? You've got nothing. And, it, and if you can't appreciate how deflating that can be, then you've never lost anything worth having. You build your identity off of your capabilities, and then you get injured overseas serving our country and come back and and then you start asking, who am I if I am not the person that I was for the first 30 years of my life? That's a difficult place to be. Or maybe you'll get to college and you'll find out that there are a lot more smart people than you thought. And you'll start to say, if I'm not smart, then why am I worth anything? And you might buy into a professor who, who kind of tells you that they're smarter than you, so you should just accept the things that they say. And if you aren't centered on Jesus, those moments are going to chink away at your faith. And what then? But if you can rejoice and say, I don't have to be smart because my God created the world and he gave me a guidebook so that I could live in it and thrive. And therefore, I'm confident in this. Even if I don't have the answer immediately in this moment, I will find an answer because I'm confident that the God of truth will supply it. You'll need that. So we need to be able to rejoice. I want you to turn to your neighbor and say, cheer up. Turn to your other neighbor and say, for real, cheer up. I want you to turn to the person behind you and say, for real, he's almost done. Cheer up. All right, look, look back at me. So the question becomes, if you can find joy, if you're going to find joy, then it sounds like, Justin, what you're saying is that we need to be like confident or our joy comes from our ability to put a positive spin on every situation. Nope, it's not what I'm saying. Do you know what I'm, I'm saying is that I don't know a single believer who doesn't have sin in their background, that doesn't through times of doubt, that doesn't have an uneven Christian performance. So what I'm saying is not that we are a people who are secure because of what we do for ourselves. Here's what I'm saying. We are people who can be secure, that we can rejoice in any and every circumstance and help people direct their gaze to heaven if earth is just not doable at the moment. Because we are sure that God is sure of us. And since our faith is resting on what he did for us and is at work in us to do and complete, that that's all the confidence we need. That's all we got to do. 
And if you can adapt that mindset, then you can rejoice always. And not in a way that says, yeah, how are you? Delighting in Jesus. As if saying something Christianly makes it true. Or meaningful. We're talking about embracing the life of Jesus, not the trite talk of people who are professionally Christian. This is the work that God wants to do in you. This is how you'll have an impact in speaking life to people. Just real quickly, let me close here. The Lord is at hand, he says. Or, sorry, verse 5. So let your big-heartedness be known to everyone. Why? Because the Lord is at hand. That means two things. He is watching, not to trip you up, but he is present. So you should live with an awareness that the presence of God is here and with us, and that should give us some, like, get up and go, right? We don't want to be people who, like, fail to launch or fail to, like, grow up or be adults and understand that that means sometimes tucking in a shirt. Sometimes it means making hard decisions and sharing the gospel even if it's costly. Sometimes that means we are motivated because God is here and we believe that he will return and therefore we don't have an infinite amount of time to share the gospel with friends. I'll never forget a youth group the first summer I did camp that came to camp grieving because they'd been witnessing to a guy for six months but they, they just hadn't gotten to the place where they were sharing the gospel and then there was a car accident and some of the kids were driving with this unbeliever friend of theirs and, and they'd just been kind of doing this thing where they were being friendly but they came to camp because in the car accident, he had died and they had lived. And they were left with the question, why didn't we share the gospel with him? Now, it's a good thing that we aren't the only ones who are called to share the gospel. And God isn't dependent on us to be perfect so that people can hear the gospel and have an opportunity to believe. But it does teach us that we need to be ready to give answers and to be active in sharing our faith. And the way that we do that is not belligerence. Look what he says. Let your big heartedness be known to everyone so that the rejoicing can't be trite if your settled heart is constantly able to rejoice in a meaningful capacity. It means you have an answer for why you can be satisfied even though your dreams are going unfulfilled and your sisters aren't that you're able to talk about that in a way that doesn't show like your body language saying like I'm angry and, I, and I'm resentful, but it says God is good all the time even if I am not aware of his goodness in this moment to me. It says I'm humble enough to look at, at the, the story of the scriptures and say that God's working for my good, so what I must have wanted may not have been for my good, and God's willing to take it away to give me himself, which is better. Isn't that what we want? So that gentleness and reasonableness can't come if we aren't confident in Jesus. And then this is this wonderful promise that we see in verse 6. So don't be anxious about anything. Because if you are having to acquire because your identity or your confidence is built on what you have, what you own, the position that you hold, listen, you can never rest. You can never take a Sabbath if you are convinced that your effort gets results. Sabbath is a testament to the fact that we recognize that we need God to work on our behalf to acquire any good thing. We take a break because we are not the only one who provides for us, but God does. So we don't have to endlessly be mourning from activity to activity or, or spending our lives kind of in this constant pursuit of more. Because God gives generously to his people like a good father does. So what about you? Maybe that's one of the things that's keeping you from evangelism is an ability to take a step back and have time and space to develop friendships in a way that are like person to person. Slow moments where you can have a conversation that's meaningful. Because the reality is, look, here, here's why I'm worried about your generation and my son growing up in a close generation to yours. I don't know how generations work. Maybe in your generation. I, I wouldn't know. Here's, here's why. Because there is so much illusion of connectivity for you 
you can text, Snapchat, send pictures, send short videos, that you can grow up and not ever really know how to have meaningful friendships because either you moved a lot or you were constantly connecting to people through different medians, that you're uncomfortable person to person having a deep relationship where you let them know you, not the you you present to the world. And, and here's the thing I've discovered about my use of technology. Even though it could connect me, often what it does is it isolates me. Because it's easier to connect with you on text if you don't know when I read the text, and therefore you don't expect an answer. And it's all about my time in that moment. I'm worried about that for you, because some of you are going to struggle in marriage because no one's ever known you. And so when, when you say, I do, you're not aware of the, of the work that that's going to take. But here's the great truth of Scripture, that God won't leave you alone in that moment. Here's what he says, in everything. In other words, God is able to work in your life in a way that regardless of the problems or difficulties you face, he is able to step in and minister to us. So in prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving always at the root of it, let your requests be made known to God and treat God as if you expect him to answer you. Because prayer is a confession that we talk because we believe at the end of the day that God hears us and he listens and he answers. So we pray because we, we know our hope is in God and it's in that God is who he says he is and he does what he says he will do. And we can rest in that. Amen? And you know what happens when you do all of this, Paul says? The peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. It gives you a prayerful confidence. And don't miss the beauty of what Paul does in verse 7. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard. It will block you in. Where is he writing this from? Prison. In the same way that prison confines him, isolates him, separates him. Here's what he says. That Christ will guard your hearts, protect them, keep them safe, and give you strength. Make it secure and unassailable. Just like the prison walls have done for me. And what I love about Paul is he didn't just talk about being happy. He was able to be happy as he wrote the letter from prison. So here's what we need to do. Rejoice always. And you will find joy in Christ Jesus and in Christian community.